Hello, my name is Mr. McClintock, and today I'm going to share with you one of my favorite creepy stories that we're going to read together, which is The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Follow along with me as we read together, and let's see what this story brings us. The Thousand Injuries of Fortunato. I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who so well know the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled, but from a very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither the word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his emulation. I'm going to pause here, and I'll do this throughout the story, because there's some weird things to this story. It's set in an old-fashioned version of Italy where things are a little bit different. But right off the bat, notice who's telling us this story. The narrator reciting the story is this creepy guy who smiles at the thought of someone else's killing or sacrifice. Bam, right off the bat, we have a story about somebody who wants to kill someone else. That's creepy. And he's telling us why and what's going on with it. Let's continue on as we read. He had a weak point. This Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared, he prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmery, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and brought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on tight fitting peri striped dress and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should have never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, my dear Fortunato, we you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How, he said he, Amontillado, a pipe? Impossible and in the midst of the carnival. Now, I'm gonna pause again. Two things you need to understand about this. First of all, carnival is a huge celebration, usually before Lent, much like what we have for Fat Tuesday, um, and is hugely important. And a cask is a giant barrel of wine, where they talk about a pipe as well too, which is a smaller version of it. But either way, we're talking a lot of wine. And Amontillado is a type of Italian wine that, uh, in this case, he's not sure if it's actually the wine he bought or not. So he's trying to present it to this guy, Fortunato, right? And motley is a weird thing. So to give you a sense of the crazy, exuberant party atmosphere of Carnival, people are walking around like Fortunato wearing clothes like this. This is what's traditional medieval motley. Uh, and that's what Fortunato is wearing. So he's dressed to the nines in his craziest costume, just out partying, getting drunk off his gourd like a crazy college student. Um, and that's an important idea to this. He's out living life deeply when all of this is happening. And that's part of what's called irony, that he's living his life to the fullest, really having a good time, not a care in the world. And that's when he comes across our narrator. 
I have my doubts, I replied. And I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado, I have my doubts. Amontillado, and I must satisfy them. Amontillado, as you are engaged, I'm on my way to Lucenti. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me Lucenti can't not tell Amontillado from Sherry. Well, and yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. No, my friend, no. I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucenti, no, I have no engagement. <laughs> Come, my friend, no. It is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They're encrusted with nitre. Well, let's go nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you have been imposed upon. And I, as I, for Lashenti, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. The speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm. Putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a reliquaire closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, and soon as my back was turned. I love the irony of that. He wants his servants to leave. And so instead of saying, go party, he says, you have to stay here, but I'll be gone until the morning. And so what does he know? He knows they're all gone because the master's away, right? This also points out that the narrator and Fortunato are pretty rich dudes. A palazzo is like a big old house. He's got servants. He can buy casks of wine, right? This guy is from a famous rich family in Italy. We don't know much about it beyond that. I took from the sconces two flambeaux and gave one to Fortunato, bowed him through the several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. Now, again, I have to pause. I don't know about the rest of you all. I don't have catacombs beneath my house. So let's talk about what that means. Um, especially in Italy, uh, you would often have catacombs below your house. Something like this. If you've played Skyrim, you've gone through a bajillion catacombs filled with dead bodies, some of which come and attack you. But even if you haven't, you should be passingly familiar with this. The basements of large houses were filled with spaces to bury their dead because just burying someone in a cemetery is kind of modern and they didn't have a lot of spare space. So they would put the dead bodies down in the catacombs below the house. Well, it turns out if you have a giant basement, it's also a great place to store wine, as well as other supplies you might need for the house. So people would have, along with the dead bodies of their past Aunt Edna's and uncle, grandpa's and people, uh, would also store their wine and they would store food. And this was really common. It still is, in fact, um, that if you happen to be in a place where your house slash mansion is large enough to have catacombs, you might want to store things down there because it's a sub-basement below the ground. And that's pretty important. He hands Fortunato a flambeau, a torch, because there's no lights. This is long before electricity. So they have to shine their way through a giant catacomb with a torch to keep them, excuse me, to keep them focused on where they're at. So they're now in the darkness, surrounded by dead bodies, looking for a cask of wine. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, said he. It's farther on, said I, but observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the ruin of intoxication. Nature, he asked at length. Nature, I replied. How long have you had that cough? <coughs> 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 
My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It's nothing, he said at last. Come, I said, I with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucienci. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True. True, I replied, and indeed I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. A draft of this medic will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him with the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us, and I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. The vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot d'or in the field azure, the foot crashes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune la science. Good, he said. Okay, now that was weird, right? Coats of arms were really important in the medieval era of describing what your family was like. Montessor describes his family coat of arms, which looks like this. A giant foot crushing a snake and the snake biting at the heel, right? And Nemo me impulli la scient is Latin. No one insults without impunity. In other words, if someone insults us, we get revenge. And that's what this whole story is about, right? So we see in the image the very thing that's happening in the course of this story, down in the deep, dark catacombs. One other note while we're paused, we should talk about nitre or nitre is nitrous oxide is the common term for it. It builds up in catacombs in places where the gas grows and literally adds like webbing and designs to the sides of the stone. Um, in this case, they notice it a lot. It's also not good to breathe because you know, it's not air. So if you're in a place with lots of nitre, it, you can suffocate actually. And if you already have a cold as Fortunato does, it makes it hard to get around. So that's gonna come up a couple times because it's this reminder of, look, they're in a dangerous place here. It's full of nitre. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medoc. We passed through the walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again and this time, I made bold to seize Fortunato by the arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the walls. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it's too late. Your cough is nothing, he said. Let's go on. But first, another draft of the medic. Medoc, by the way, is a, another type of wine. A little bit cheaper. I broke and reached him a flagon of de grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You're not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I said, yes, yes. You? Impossible. A mason? A mason, I replied. A sign, he said. It is this, I answered, producing from beneath the folds of my reliquary a trowel. <laughs> you jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. 
Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak, and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. Let me pause again. That was a weird exchange, wasn't it? Fortunato is a member of the Masons, which was at this time a secret organization of people who built society was the idea. So the best and most powerful people in a town would often get together in essentially a club and they'd hang out and talk and make plans and build their town, figuratively, not literally. So he uses a secret gesture to see if the narrator is part of the Masons and the narrator's like, what are you doing, dude? Like what kind of weird handshake hand signal is that, right? And he says, oh, you're not a mason, right? And the narrator pulls out a trowel, a thing you actually use to lay brick, a random tool. Who carries a trowel with them? That's so weird. And even Fortunato steps back, he's like, huh, that's that's weird. You're jesting, you're joking, man. What's going on? You're just, you're just messing with me. But this is a little foreshadowing too. Right? We know already that the narrator wants to kill Fortunato. We know he's taking them into a crypt, and then suddenly, bam, he's got a trowel on him? What the heck? Let's see what he does with it. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within this wall, thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess. In depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven, it seemed to have been constructed for no special use in itself, but formidably merely the interval between the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depths of this recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Herein is the Amontillado. As for Lucchesi, He's an ignoramus, interrupted my friend, as he stepped unsteadily forward, which I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche. And finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A mere moment I had fettered him into the granite. In the surface were two iron staples distinct from each other about two feet horizontally, and from one depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was much too astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. So again, in a little alcove, just a little section off, there's a couple chains hanging, and he's locked him in there. He's just tied him up with chains, stuck to the wall in the middle of this little hole. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nature. Indeed, it's very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? <laughs> then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado, ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied. <laughs> the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication of I had I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depths of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with the most satisfaction. I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel, 
and finished without interruption the fifth and the sixth and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level of my breast, and again I paused and holded the flambeau or the mason work through the few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated, I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfaction. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed, I aided, I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight. My task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from the lish a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A good joke, indeed. An excellent jest. We'll have many a rich laugh about this at the Palazzo. <laughs> over, over the wine. <laughs> the Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yeah, 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 the Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will, will not they be awaiting us at the Palazzo? The Lady of Fortunato, the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor. Yes, I said. For the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato! No answer. I called again, Fortunato! No answer, still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick, on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected an old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiscat. The end. Oh, is that creepy or what? What a weird way to end. He walls him into the catacombs, he leaves. And it's done. Creepy story. I love it. My favorite part. It's easy to miss. This line right here. For half a century, no mortal disturbed them. Meaning no one came down to the catacombs for 50 years. But here's my question. How does Montresor know that? That means he came back to check, and that's even creepier. Hope you enjoyed the story. Thank you.